This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Can people really be rehabilitated? Welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host, and today I'm with Justine and Amanda, which I may say, this is my first threesome. Yay! Hi! I, Thank you so that. much for having us on. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> so I'm Justine. I'm a criminal defense attorney, also a host of Gin and Justice podcast with Amanda. And I'm Amanda, and I'm a legal assistant and co-host of Gin and Justice. (laughs) I love that name. That was brilliant. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) I think we were drinking when we came up with it. (laughs) We love gin, and, you know, we do talk about justice a lot, so it just (laughs) seemed like it worked. Yes. No, it was very creative. And and then I get Snoop Dogg kind of playing in my head. Yeah, so. <laughs> we're we're hoping one day he doesn't sue us or anything, you know. <laughs> I highly doubt it because you will take him down. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been a defense attorney for? Oh, let's see. Almost going on seven years now. Wow. And that's as an attorney. But prior to that, um, I law clerked for a defense attorney while I was in law school And then when I was an undergrad, I studied treatment courts and I also clerked with a, like a pro se legal clinic when I was an undergrad as well. So, but as an attorney, seven years, almost seven years. What made you want to do the defense side? So I (laughs) am a defense attorney at heart. Um, Everything that I believe in falls on the defense side. So for me, I grew up in addiction. Multiple family members of mine were in active addiction and some unfortunately still are. And it really affected my life in so many ways. And because of what I grew up in and what I saw, I learned to have a lot of empathy for people who are really in hard times. And I saw particularly how unfair I thought the justice system was to one of my loved ones and uh, who was, I didn't know it at the time because I was young, but he was in active addiction. I didn't know, you know, when we were going through all of this, that what addiction was, I didn't know it was a disease. I just knew, you know, someone I cared about in my family was in jail and it was for an extended period of time. And I just thought it was unfair. That's really what started me kind of on that road And then I learned about addiction being a disease. And then, uh, you know, I had several more things that I went through in life that gave me the ability to have empathy for people who have trauma and maybe don't make the right or the best decisions and unfortunately end up in the never ending cycle of our criminal justice system. And so me as like a young person, I, I think I knew in like seventh grade, I wanted to be a lawyer. And my goal was like, I was going to grow up and be a lawyer and like save everybody, uh, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, kind of a little naive, but um, yeah, so that's why I ended up. So I ended up where I am. Very cool. And Amanda, (laughs) how did you end up being a legal assistant? I actually stumbled upon this job randomly. (laughs) Um, I was looking for a change and um, this defense firm needed a receptionist at the time and I said okay sure and that's how I got my foot in the door and then I just saw how minorities and people with mental illness and people suffering from addiction how the criminal justice system chews them up and spits them out and it's a revolving door and the cycle of systematic slavery of people and it lit a fire. And now I'm an advocate. So not quite the same, but 
I was always um, a little bit of an activist. I just didn't um, realize that criminal justice reform was going to be where I would go. (laughs) I mean, it is needed for sure. I think we can all say that, obviously, in my opinion, if you get arrested for drugs and then a week later you're back in for drugs and give it another month, clearly this person has a problem. And instead of just throwing them back on the streets time and time again, why don't we put them in a program? Why don't we get them counseling? There's evidence-based science out there that shows that there is ways to fix the problem and it's not warehousing people in a prison. Now, I believe some people definitely belong there. Those are your pedophiles, sex criminals, murderers. They need to stay there. But, I mean, you know, if Tommy's got some weed on him, like, can we not send him to prison for, like, 15 years? Come on. The guy who murdered his neighbor got, like, four. So. That's the other thing. Like, sentencing in this country is wacky. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, Tiffany, you bring up a really interesting point. And so that's a lot of people, right? They're like, the sex offenders and the murderers, they need to be in prison. Um, I've had the... Uh, I say this in a weird way. I've had the pleasure of working with several sex offenders. And I don't mean that in a weird way. It just comes out (laughs) weird when I say it. But um, the nice thing, my favorite part about being a defense attorney is I get to work with people who nobody wants to talk to. And I get to know them for months or years or however long their case is open. And my job is to most of the time people don't want to fight their cases. Most of the time people do say, hey, I'm guilty. Can you just help me out? Or they say, hey, yes, I did this. This is why. And I've had, you know, the opportunity to to deal with sex offenders on that level and people charged with sex crimes. And what I've found is that most of them were victims of abuse themselves and the system failed them in several ways. They grew up not knowing that that's not appropriate. And unfortunately, their childhood trauma has now cycled into adulthood and they act out. Now, unfortunately, most of the time, the criminal justice system doesn't care about what they have been through. But um, that is part of my job is being able to humanize them. And then same thing with people who commit murder. There's like Uh, several ways that that can come about. And I was gonna say, we have had the pleasure and I'm going to say pleasure of meeting a few different people that were labeled murderer um, that have changed my life. Yes. Yeah. David yeah, Garlock had, for one. Yeah. He's yeah, so just... he is he is actually a convicted well actually he's not technically convicted anymore. He is he did commit a murder mm-hmm. and he went to prison for I think like 13 years for it in Alabama. He completely changed his life over, worked on his childhood trauma and then did so well in life that not only was he um let out on parole, he successfully completed parole. But the governor of Alabama, who never gives pardons to anybody, uh, gave him a full pardon two years ago. And he's just doing amazing criminal justice reform work, uh, going around, uh, speaking at colleges, universities, wherever, offices to lawyers, to judges. And it's so cool. So and we've also (laughs) sorry. (laughs) And we've also gotten to talk to murder victims family members that are against the death penalty and that was a very interesting perspective that i wasn't expecting and that was also transformative i thought yeah yeah and it's interesting because there are like amanda said earlier there are evidence-based practices that we as a country can and do have the ability to put in place other countries typically don't imprison people for life even for murder they will, and I can't remember if it was like Germany or Sweden. I watched this really cool documentary about what they do. I want to say it was Sweden. Anyways, whatever country it was, it was over there. <laughs> they, the first thing that happens when someone's sent to prison, the first thing they do is meet with a psychiatrist and a case manager and they develop a case plan of, okay, this is what you're convicted of. Here's your background. Here's all the things we need to work on. And they successfully complete all of these steps, you know, in, in throughout the years in prison, they start getting like weekend home passes and then week home. So they're transitioned slowly back into society after completing their case plan. And then 
by the time they're let out, it's not shell shock. Uh, there's not a huge reentry problem. They've already integrated back in with their family, maybe mended any bridges that needed to be mended, you know, have established themselves with perhaps work and a place to live and all of that before they get out of prison because they've been out, you know, on weekends or weeks or whatever it is. And they have much higher success rates with actual corrections of offenders as opposed to. Because that's the point. Right. Of prisons. You're supposed to be making people better for society to come back into society, not to stay in prison and be free labor for the the man. Which I totally get. Just some people aren't rehabilitated. Like you cannot, you can't. Like some of these people, and I totally get like the whole trauma. Like most serial killers were molested, neglected, abused. And that's why, you know, I would agree that there's some people away. that I mean, I wouldn't if if some serial killers like Ted Bundy were still around I'd be like, yeah, that guy shouldn't be let out, you know, <laughs> like, you know, right. No, absolutely. But. And I get like there's a lot of reasons why people are the way they are. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the back end of why I do what I do, yeah. because I think everyone does deserve a chance. But you yeah, have nobody's... to want it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But nobody should be judged as a whole by the worst thing that they've ever done. Yeah. And I think what you'll see, too, when you look at sentencing and the sentences people are serving, the people who are serving the longest sentences or life sentences are not the worst of the worst. That is typically not how it works out. They are typically the most vulnerable um, underserved minorities. Yes. And uh, that's so that's a huge problem that we have to address as a as a country, because we do have a problem with mass incarceration. There are people serving life sentences for crimes where nobody was hurt. Nobody was killed. Uh, and we have a person serving a life sentence. Currently on Florida's death row, we have an 18 year old. He was 18 years old and 25 days. So it was 25 days after his 18th birthday when he committed a murder and he's on death row and the appeals court just upheld that. And we know as a society, right? Especially males brains, no offense, men <laughs> do, not, do not develop until uh, their mid twenties. And so we are holding an 18 year old accountable or who was 18, uh, obviously not 18 anymore for a mistake or a wrong choice that was made at 18 and we are putting an individual to death for that. So, so those are kind of like some of the things that, that I, that really fire me up as a defense attorney. And we ultimately decided to start our podcast because we I, do this all I, the time. I, well, no, cause I learned, I learned, you know, like I said earlier, my goal going into criminal defense was I thought I was going to like save the world. (laughs) That's what I thought. And being a defense attorney is basically being against the world because it's so the opposite of what people want. But uh, the other thing I've learned is that a lot of things that I have issue with as a defense attorney, I have zero control over. I can't change them as a lawyer. I can't fix them as a lawyer. So um, that's kind of why you know, we do what we do because we want to make people aware of the facts and the data and um, the evidence and what really actually goes on in the criminal justice system. Right. I mean, it's so broken that it's, it's scary and it's sad and everybody talks about how broken it is, but nobody knows how to fix it. How do we fix it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is we have to elect people that will use evidence-based practices and to use the money in to mental health and to treatment instead of warehousing people. Right. No, I totally get that. Just the people who want to touch children and then they do their time and then they get out and they do it again. And then, and I get, they didn't have the, the proper healing Sup- or whatever it is, but surprisingly though, um, the recidivism rate of child Central molestation yeah. is very low. The other thing too, is um, there's kind of this like big 
voodooed all of the sex offender who does six months in jail and then gets out and, you know, does it again and, he's re- and then gets on probation. I'm going to tell you that does not happen. People Life for a sex children. offender is almost impossible. Well, no, it's most it's if the person's under 12, especially here in Florida and very similar in other states, uh, that person is going to prison for life. There's no way around it unless the state attorney agrees to something below that. The judge doesn't have a, the power to sentence somebody below life. The defense attorney can put on the best sentencing preparation ever, and we can't change it. Uh, the only person who can waive that is the state attorney. So most sex offenders, uh, particularly people who commit sexual battery on children under 12, uh, get automatic life in prison. So, and it does obviously vary from state to state, but what we see often is the, the major media, not the alternative media is like podcasts, which is why I love what you're doing with your podcast, because you get so in depth with people into the situations they're in Mm -hmm. and like how it led them to where they are today. And I love that. Um, So thank you for doing what you do. Um, Absolutely. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but traditional media does they push they push a narrative and they will they they kind of push this narrative of these elusive sex offenders who get no time or they get six months in jail i heard that one a lot and then it was funny because then the more i practiced i was like wait where are my six month plea offers like why am i not getting these and then i'm like realizing oh that doesn't happen um obviously there are cases where there is an unfortunate, you know, sequence of events and that does happen. And then also what happens. Sorry. What are like, I understand because it's fucked up, but like, what are sex, what are pedophiles supposed to do before they hurt a kid? Ooh, like, what do so, they do? Okay. So this is, what, interesting. Do you do if you, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> So it's interesting, right? Because it is a it is a brain disorder, much like addiction, right? Where like I've is... never heard about a um, counselor for pedof- pedophiles. Have you? Because I haven't. <laughs> is there a doctor for that? Because I don't think there is. So yeah, interestingly, um, I had a friend back in New York who went into probation and parole, and she went into correction the correction system, and she specifically worked with sex offenders. And she actually became really passionate about working with them. And at this time, I was not working in law yet. I was like an undergrad. And I was like, why does this chick want to work with sex offenders? Like, what was wrong with her? And she would talk about it. And it was like what she made very clear to me when I was like questioning her about like, what are you doing? She Mm -hmm. said, there is no treatment prior to an offense occurring. If a person has sexual urges that are not proper that are uh urges with children there is nobody that they can go to there's no counselors there is no therapist there's no psychologist available the only treatment that's available for sex offenders is post prison or in prison so that's like problem number 1 we are a super reactive society instead of being proactive and it kind of bleeds into the broken healthcare system in this country also <laughs> We're screwed on both ends. <laughs> we're, we're screwed in a lot of ways. If we're going to be real. <laughs> so, but I've had, um, I've had people that, you know, were charged with sexual crimes and they're like, listen, I was trying to get help for like two years. I was going to counseling. They kept basically saying, we're not talking about that. I was able to get records and say, Hey, like, to the prosecutor, Hey, this person was trying to get treatment. Look, here's all of the medical records where they brought it up and the counselor didn't, there was nothing the counselor could do because they're not trained in that. They couldn't make referrals anywhere because there's nothing that's pre, you know, whatever, uh, pre basically offense, pre prison, pre jail, nothing that's available. And so, uh, he did try and get help for his urges prior to committing any type of offense and, uh, it, you know, at some point it just, it's not controllable anymore if you don't have the proper treatment. So, and if we're being completely real about it, the number of cases is astronomical. So it's like a big problem that like 
society's just ignoring. Right. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because Tiffany's you, like, I'm not. <laughs> no. Because now it's you just, you set that child up for a life of disaster. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and it's I a vicious cycle that's just never ending. And I don't know if they even ever think about that. Like, did you ever ask any of the people you defended? Like, did you know what you're going to do to this person by doing this? Like some of them, they kill themselves or they become prostitutes or, you know, drug addicts, or it can go so left, like you're lost. So do they even think of that or no? I haven't had, so obviously I can't discuss very specific um, conversations But I can tell you from working with, because I look at uh, sex offenses much like I look at addiction. It's a brain disorder. It is a rehardwiring of the brain. And basically it's evolved because of certain factors, whether it's environmental, genetic, you know, biosocial, all of the above, trauma, mix all that in there. And that's what can cause uh, somebody to, you know, act or have a brain disorder in that way much like somebody who is a cocaine addict, right? And they just have gotten their kids taken away. They've lost their job. They're losing their house. They're not thinking about that when they are having, because it's a compulsion, right? It's not anything to do with any consequences. It is a complete brain compulsion. And so that is- They're not thinking about that. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. So to answer your question, no, I don't think they are. I haven't specifically asked them, but- uh, I don't think that's what's going through their mind at the time. I mean, that makes sense in a way when you put it that way, because obviously they're out to get their fix. They don't mm-hmm. care from where. Definitely rem- there's been remorse after the fact, though. So, I mean, I don't know. J- much like somebody who uses cocaine and then realizes, man, I just like threw away. like my, I lost know. my kids over this. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, it's, it's really a compulsion and, and there are ways to deal with compulsion if, if we have the way to deal with treatment. And I think being proactive is much better than being reactive because we wouldn't be having these conversations. Right. We could be it's actually and... less children getting molested, you know, that's I what mean, we that makes, want. <laughs> so. That makes so much sense. And it's a shame there's nothing out there like that. Mm-hmm. Like people don't want to touch it. I think they're scared of yep the whole thing around it and they're just like "Mm -mm." but it it needs to be it needs to be talked about it it needs to change because we can't have the society because what's going to happen when they get in their 20s or 30s Hmm, now 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 they're checking out other kids you know it's just it's breaking the cycle that's what we need to do breaking the cycle exactly and you know it's interesting because as we're talking about this i think about the people who are sitting in prison for life because of, um, you know, a choice that they made. Right. And then you think about all of like the Catholic priests who were just moved from church to church to church. And that Mm -hmm. was just completely covered up. And I don't know if those people will ever be prosecuted, even though if we just saw the recent release of the Baltimore investigation of like what was going on in Baltimore, but those guys are not going to get life in prison. So it's very selective the sentencing is very selective. Um, they, they deem who they think is a throwaway and then they choose who kind of can get redemption. So. I agree a hundred percent there. Yeah. Where in Florida are you? We are in central, central Florida. So am I. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Yes. I'm in Pinellas you- County. Oh, we're on the <laughs> other side. <Yeah. laughs> that's <East> that's Coast. <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Right. We're not very far at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll be over there in October for that criminal justice summit. Mm-hmm. You should attend. It's a Tampa Bay criminal justice summit. They, It's like a day-long Super Basically interesting. a bunch of panels. Yeah, a bunch of panels talking about different ways to approach criminal justice. And they had uh, various senators and who else did they have? They had representatives and mm-hmm. formerly and- incarcerated people. Um, 
they had Big family members in the, in the audience asking some penetrating questions. I'm so. intrigued. It was good. It was it, good. It also it also came with breakfast and lunch, so that was a plus. Yes. <laughs> Is it sandwiches? No, it no, was, it was uh, actually really it good. Was like, I want to say it was like Mexican food for lunch, and like healthy. There was like some healthy stuff because Amanda and I are vegetarians, so yeah, we were able to find a bunch <laughs> of stuff to eat. There was some good chocolate there too. Whatever those little mm. things mm-hmm. were with the sprinkles, <laughs> they were so good. <laughs> to check that out. <laughs> is this like an every year thing or last year was the first year and then they got confirmation they'll be doing it again this year it's at the tampa preparatory school mm. so, it's about yeah. 30 minutes away there you go <laughs> there you go we'll have to meet up there yes yeah. that would be awesome that would be so fun <laughs> and then we could really do this over cocktails yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go <laughs> well I have mine. <laughs> I have my water, but we'll pretend it's gin. <laughs> so I know you were saying that you do not believe in the death penalty. So do you want to go into it? I'm sure it's because of reform that it's possible, but do you want to go in depth a little more? Sure. So I have a, I have quite a few reasons that I am opposed to the death penalty. Um, first and foremost, I was like a little emo kid when I was growing up and I was an anarchist, uh, when I was in high school, middle school, high school, I was very anti-government and, uh, there's still that inner core in me, even though, (laughs) you know, I've got my blonde hair back and I like somehow managed to like close all my facial piercings and all that. Um, I don't think the government, first and foremost, I don't think the government should have that much power. Amen choose to execute somebody. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. Second reason it is for me, when you have someone like Ted Bundy, we'll just keep going with him because he's always, <laughs> everybody knows who Ted Bundy is. If you have somebody like Ted Bundy, he's one of the worst of the worst. Putting him in prison for life is going to make him suffer more than putting him out of his misery. And let's be real. The the American justice system is about punishing people and retribution and this like, you know, kind of like, yeah, we got you and you're going to suffer, right? It's about people suffering. That's what it's about. We want people to suffer. It's been like that since prior to the colonists becoming, you know, the United States of America with the Salem witch trials. They wanted people to suffer. That's just how it was. And that's just carried on. That's just part of our culture. And so why not, when you have somebody like Ted Bundy, put him in prison for life and study him so we can figure out, like, why he did this, right? You, like, talk with him with psychologists, psychiatrists, different people. And so you can maybe prevent that from happening in another person's brain. Maybe. The death penalty is also completely a waste of taxpayer money. So currently on Florida's death row, we have somebody who's been on there since, I think, 1975. 1975. Uh, He has been on death row the longest. He's not scheduled for execution anytime soon, but his birthday is during World War II. So, you know, I, I don't know how much harm that man is, like what the purpose of executing him when his crime was 50 years ago. What lesson are we showing? How is that a deterrent when 50 years passes between somebody committing a crime to, you know, he's not, like I said, he's not even scheduled for execution. So, and I'm not pushing for that by any means. I know Florida's moving at a rapid rate in executions currently, but uh, it's not cost effective. It is more cost friendly to taxpayers to house somebody in prison for life, believe it or not. Uh, The appellate process takes years and years and years. There are several organizations of family members who do not want the death penalty. They are dragged through the trauma of not only a trial, but then every time there is a, because there's a series of appeals, as there should be if you're going to put somebody to death, they are dragged through the trauma over and over again for decades while appeals go on, Uh, sometimes resentencings. There's a resentencing happening right now from a crime that happened 20 years ago. And the families are being dragged through that again. Uh, So it just doesn't make sense. There has been 190 exonerations from death row. 
that on record. Yes. Since 1989. Those are people so that were probably... sentenced to death that did not commit the crimes and should not have been put on death row. Yes. That's how often we get it wrong wow. that, we've that we know, know of. about, that we can prove. So yeah. that's probably the number one reason. Is we have we in the state of Florida and other states too, but obviously I'm Florida's Florida really bad, notorious. I think Florida's for exonerations three for exonerations off death row. So Florida, and they say that only eighty or only or the eighty percent of murders are unsolved, and we do exoneration episodes every month, and every month there's multiple murder case exonerations. So the ones that they are solving, they're pinning on people. They're not actually solving. So, like, what are we doing here? We shouldn't <laughs> right. be killing people. Why are we doing that anyway? Like, isn't that what we're trying to stop from happening? The killing? It just doesn't right. make sense. None of it makes any sense. I used to always say it was an easy way out for them. Because, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, okay, they co- they they do yeah, their four or five right. years. <laughs> And then they go to, then they kill. I'm like, that's the easy way out. But mm-hmm. I like what you were saying about, you know, studying them and try to figure out what is it that made them tick. I don't know if you watched it. Um, it's on Oxygen, but Dr. Carlisle actually did do um, a big psychology thing on Ted Bundy. Interesting. Yes, yeah. because he was trying to figure out who had childhood trauma where does a normal person just snap and become a monster? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For Ted, yeah. it was when he found, I think he was like 12 and he found his birth certificate and under father, it said unknown. And that set him up right there because he felt like he was nobody. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. I'll have to check that out. But yeah, Yeah. I think that's so important, um, especially because when you do have somebody who is that messed up that you want, because unfortunately, people in life are going to experience trauma, children are going to experience trauma, and that may look different for everybody. And so if we can have a a great group, group to study of like, where do we not want trauma to lead? You know, that would be to me, make more sense. And the other sad thing about just to kind of piggyback on what Amanda was saying about people who are exonerated, we speak to death row exonerees all the time. And we had, uh, so it's funny because when Amanda and I started our show, I'm anti-death penalty. I'm from like upstate New York, Vermont. So we're like anti-government, anti-death penalty, like hippie granola people up there. Um, we all like grow our own food, whatever. And then I moved to Florida. I don't know what I was doing, but here I am. But, um, and Amanda, I hope you don't care. I share this, but she was, no, she, she was for the death penalty when we started the show. I wouldn't um, say I was for it. I just, not was... for it. she wasn't against, she wasn't against it. There, against we, go. It. there we go. I, there we I go. was one of those people that thought the worst of the worst, who cares? Like put them out. Who cares? Um, but then I met Juan Melendez that was the first death row exoneree I met and he changed my life. <laughs> yeah. and he did. He touched, uh, like he touched my soul, that man. Yeah. And he spent almost 18 years on death row and, uh, he talks and now about he's just trauma. an advocate. Yeah. He talks about the trauma from that. And what's really interesting about the death row exoneree and the exonerees in general, but I think we've talked to more death row exonerees than we have regular exonerees. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. They have gone through so much trauma from the criminal justice system and being incarcerated uh, specifically on death row for a crime they did not commit. And they come out and they're the most optimistic, wonderful, grateful people, which is like incredible. Um, And there's a woman that we interviewed. Are you going to tell her about Sonny Jacobs? (laughs) Yes. I was going to bring her up. So Sonny Jacobs was this woman in the 70s. She was the only woman on death row. Her and her husband were wrongfully convicted of killing a police officer in Florida. She and her husband fought for their innocence for decades. Uh, I believe the police or the state attorneys knew several decades before they were actually exonerated. Unfortunately, 
uh, when she was exonerated and found that she did not kill the police officer, her husband had already been executed by the state of Florida. In a botched execution that took eight minutes and there were flames coming off of his head for a crime he did not commit. So that's why and I'm Sunny, that penalty. being the only woman on death row, was living living in complete solitude. Nobody was allowed to talk to her. But yeah, she wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. The guards weren't allowed to talk to her. Nobody spoke to her for years. Like that's torture. I was always told that the people on death row live better than the people no. who are. I heard you get the better meals. And no. like people want to be segregated so you're not getting in fights, getting raped, all that good stuff. Not true. No. No, horror stories. Really We've heard small. nothing but horror stories. Yeah. Six by nine cells. They're complete isolation. They share their so, meals with roaches. Yeah. Uh nobody speaks to them. The lights flicker every time the electric this is back when they were using the electric chair. The lights in the death row uh sections of the prison flicker which tells you that somebody's in the chair um, during, during one of our interviews um, there was like a storm happening and he, he lost power for a second. And when he came back, he was like full blown PTSD trigger, like yeah. cry, like could barely breathe. It was like, it was heart wrenching. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't imagine. I mean, your whole life is gone because you mm -hmm. were sitting behind bars and they don't even give you anything. I think back in the day they used to hand you a hundred bucks and say, good luck. Yep. Yeah, I know uh, when I was still living in New York, my loved one got out of prison and he was given $40 in a condom and it was expired. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever that's worth. <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> Nothing about the system, the condom, nothing's working. Yeah, you probably couldn't even undo it. <laughs> well, it was not a loved one that I was intimate with. He was a family member, so I have no idea. I just remember we were laughing about it, and I was like, um, this is expired. You shouldn't use this. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> Uh, I totally see your guys' point. Like, I do. I get it. It's just some people are just, I don't know. <laughs> it's like you get torn because you know yeah. some people literally are monsters. That's just what they are. People are capable of doing really terrible things. Yeah. And that's just facts. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I – grew up like when I was a little kid, like my parents would always watch true crime shows. And that's what I was like watching from a very young age. And I was not allowed to change the channel, even though they were like snoozing. And I'd be like, oh, Ugh, I'm all parents some... did that, dude. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to put on some cartoons. And the second I would like change the channel, my dad would be like, put that back. I'm like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> and I remember being really young. So they would always watch like forensic files or like City Confidential, like the ones that were solved or like Dateline or whatever. And then one day Unsolved Mysteries was on, but I didn't know that it was Unsolved Mysteries. I had never seen it before. So they're talking about this brutal murder. This guy named Wadada. I remember his name. <laughs> Traumatized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beat his girlfriend to death with a hammer. So I'm like watching this probably like seven years old, like just, you know, eyes like bug eyed. And I'm like, okay, like I'm waiting for them to solve it because that's all the shows that I've watched. Like the cops solve it, right? And that's <laughs> what I've seen. And then, you know, Robert Stack, the host of Unsolved Mysteries with this real creepy voice with his trench coat that he always wore. And I swear to God, he was always walking through like a graveyard or something. He goes, <laughs> if you have any information on the whereabouts of Wadada Jones, call. And I was like, wait a second. They don't know where he is? <laughs> yeah. I'm like... My parents are sleeping. They have no idea. I'm terrified that Wadada is about to come flying through our living room door. Uh, and Aww. that's that's how I grew up. It's like the true crime, worst of the worst, right? Whatever makes a good story is like. And so 
And then it's just really interesting that I got into this field and I kind of see things. And I used to listen to um, this true crime podcast. I don't listen to them anymore. Uh, There were some things that I was like, no, that's not true. That's not true. But anyways, and so it was like a really dramatized storytelling of, you know, the worst of the worst murders. And the more I got into this work, the more I kind of transitioned away because it was like, I could tell the media wants, the traditional media wants whatever the best story is going to be. And that, and so in my head growing up, right, watching all that stuff. And then even as I got older, like, that's what crime was. That's who is in jail. That's who is in prison is like all of those people. And then you learn that violent crimes actually make up a really small percentage of the population. Yeah, so it's really it's mostly people that are addicted to drugs or mentally ill or uh, were born brown. But it is interesting because there are so many unsolved murders and people who straight up go missing. And it's like, you know, those like Israel Keys, are you familiar with them? I'm not. You that one's a doozy. You're you're a true crime (laughs) junkie, so you'll have to you'll have to research him. He is the creepiest. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts and I will say I'm like always kind of like, eh, you know, that guy is like the creepiest murderer, serial killer. Yeah. I've it ever. Bad. It's insane. I don't want to spoil it for you or your listeners, but if you've <laughs> heard of Israel keys, you need to look him up. There's a lot of really good podcasts on him. And so like, yeah. And I want to say, did he get executed? I think so. I think he got executed. So, you know, could like, have studied him. Could have studied him to be like, what is going on in your brain, dude? Because <laughs> it was like real messed up. It's tapestry of nightmares in there. Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to have to Google that. <laughs> oh, you're definitely going to have to. You're going to be like hooked to like researching this guy for a while. I can see it. I, yeah. I love the crime shows. I like Snapped and Web Alive mm-hmm. and all those. But Mm -hmm. I saw the patterns, and that's why when I first started this, I was reporting on these crimes. But I saw the patterns, and I'm like, these people have had really rough upbringings. And I was like, there's something more to this. And then that's when I completely changed my directory because I was like, okay, what if we can prevent this stuff from happening what if we yeah. get people the help they need before they go all Ted Bundy on your ass? And yeah, what's better than punishing people for crime? Making crimes not happen in the first right. place. Exactly. And that's why I actually started a nonprofit called The Crime Connection. And I really love that. Yes. What I want to do is either children, adults, whatever, you know, trauma happens to everybody. Get them mm. the help that they need when they need it to help, you know, future child predators, future murderers get the help that they need to work through whatever anger, Mm -hmm. whatever they're feeling inside, work past it, become normal or normaler. (laughs) (laughs) Closest to whatever normal is. (laughs) Exactly. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's so good. And I will say, I w- listened to your podcast, and I did notice at the beginning that you were covering it, and then I like transitioned into getting people's stories and like figuring out like how people got from whatever traumatic experience they went through to where they are now. And I just love that. Yes, and actually, a lot of the guests that I have are like life coaches. They do hypnosis, all that. So part of my nonprofit will be I will pay for someone's first session with them. So, you know, because a lot of people might be curious what it's like to talk to a sexologist or, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) have a life coach, but they don't want to put the money out. Well, I'm going to put the money out for them. And then if they like it, they jive, then they continue paying them on their own. But at least I can try (laughs) to push them in the right direction if they want the help. That's so awesome. That's awesome. See? Part of the solution. Part Try of the it. solution. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so cool. <laughs> we, got, we got to. I mean, we can't sit and just blame and point fingers at everybody. Like, yeah, clearly. We all just got to help each other. 
Exactly. I mean, don't get me wrong. Some people are just bad eggs. You know, you could have been posh and lived a rich life. Now you're just a spoiled brat and you just want what you want. But for the most part, it's people who are hurt themselves. Yeah. Hurt people hurt people. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. We gotta band together. <laughs> yep. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Try to save this world if we can, at least for future generations. I think ours is still pretty much screwed. But you know <laughs> I have high hopes for Gen Z. They seem to ca- they seem to care about people, so at least we got that. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. Oh man. Yeah, and I this would be great for like any psychologist or counselor that's listening because we need people to talk to people who have these thoughts in their head to try to explain or figure it out and work with them, not against them or shush them. I've had so many people on my show say that, you know, they, they'd held something in for 30 years by the time they finally told Mm -hmm. somebody the person didn't want to hear it. How's that helping them? (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah, it's so important. I will say that Amanda helped me with a really pivotal point in my life. And um, (laughs) like, basically, I didn't know the situation I was in until I was talking with Amanda a lot. And she pointed out the situation I was in. There was like a couple of things. But Amanda was a huge part of helping me get out of a really not great situation. And it was really a pivotal point in my life. And what I will say is everything that I've gone through I now can use that to have the empathy for other people and understand why they're in the situation. Now I feel like I'm really good at putting myself in someone else's head and being like, I can understand why they would did that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and it it was really a huge push towards like the self-help and the, the self-help books. I can remember several times, uh, Amanda and I going to the bookstore and at one time I was crying on the Barnes and Noble floor in the self-help section (laughs) and she sat on the floor with me. And so, you know, (laughs) so, and it's so, it's just so important to be able to make those changes and and have a lot of people don't have support. And so I think what you're doing and having, that avenue for support for people is going to create huge changes because it just takes one person in a support system. I really hope so. I mean, it's about finding self love again. You know, when you're with say a narcissist, I've dated two, um, you know, <laughs> we've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> you literally have to rebuild yourself because yeah. they knocked you down to nothing. And you have to know that you are worthy that, you know what? I'm a badass bitch. Like, no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes you have to say it and say it and say it, even if you really don't even think it until you're so annoyed with yourself that you start believing it. <laughs> That's how it works. Say it's a long process. Sometimes it's a really <laughs> long process and it's a yeah. constant weeding of the garden. Yeah. So. I think it, it's a lifelong journey. I don't think that process ever ends. Yeah. 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 Once those floodgates are open to like self self work, it's like, okay, I'm constantly Mm going to be discarding what doesn't work and opening my mind up to things that may work and and just keep moving forward. I'm glad you got off the floor. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) Amanda, you're such a good friend. (laughs) Ma'am, we we need you to leave. (laughs) Can you get your friend, please? Oh, no. <laughs> I'll go and sit on a Barnes and Noble floor with you any day, Justine. Oh, thanks. She would do the same for me. <laughs> yeah. I'll sit on the floor with you guys. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Same. <laughs> we'll have to meet at a Barnes and Noble in the middle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's funny. Is there anything else that you guys wanted to bring awareness to talk about? I don't think so. Other than if you guys are kind of interested in the facts that we are throwing out, that's really what we do on Gin and Justice. Shameless plug there. Um, We interview people every week, much like you do, but different uh, kind of different situation. We interview people that are involved with the criminal justice system in one way or another. 
and we yeah. kind of get their perspective on it. So we have a large range of perspectives from judges to lawyers, probation officers, formerly incarcerated, death row exonerees, and everything in between. So therapists, we, you know. Every Tuesday, anywhere you get your podcast. Awesome. Have you had any of your clients on there? Are they clients? I think so. <laughs> I have not uh, because I want to protect their identities. So we, and that's also why we just stick to our first names too, so we can protect the identities or locations of our, any of our people. Gotcha. All right. Awesome. Um, and you said that you're on every platform. Do you have a website too, or? We do. Gin and justice podcast.com. I, I swear to God, I love that name. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for being on. I really appreciate it. It took forever. <laughs> Thanks for having us. This was fun. I've never so been a guest before. Us. So Ooh. Um, yeah, this is our first time being a guest and <gasps> we're glad to be your first threesome. Yeah. yeah. I have my first threesome and I popped y'all's cherries. What? Yeah. <laughs> See, there we go. It works out. <laughs> I'm a hot mess, but y'all, you know what? I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah, maybe. thank you so much for having us on. We super yes. appreciate it. And thank you it. for doing everything you do. Yeah, thank we're excited you. to see where your nonprofit goes. Absolutely. And if you guys ever want to come back on, I'm down. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. For sure. Of course. You guys are cool. You're good people. Good people are hard to find. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. You are very welcome. And thank you guys so much for listening. Without you guys, there'd be no me. So I really appreciate you listening. Links will be at the bottom of the show notes. Make sure to check those out. Make sure to check out the Deluxe Networks podcast of the month. And that is Barrel Age Chicks. They talk movies. So if you're a movie person, that is your podcast. And we have Deep Dark Secrets who is unleashing the truth about the dark web and the death fetish community. And yours truly was just on their episode. So you want to check that out where I kind of dig in and explain why I think that they turn to this dark path. All right, you guys, we'll talk crime another time. Bye.